you know, shout out to Yusuf for reaching out to all of us that were at Collision. If I, you know, I may have met some of you at Collision. Um, maybe, you know, if it's my first time or at least your first time seeing me, then, uh, you know, nice to meet you all. Um, secondly, just, you know, shout out to Yusuf for setting this up and putting this together for a way for, you know, our community to connect, um, especially within tech as growing, uh, you know, a growing industry for us. And I also think that we need to find more ways to, you know, come together and figure out, uh, you know, how to just collaborate, network, share resources, so forth and so on. So you said major shout out to you. Um, and if some of you guys, if you were in that collision, I guess maybe uh, just put that you were in that collision and, and how you were able to have access to um, to the page or to the group. So uh, Takesha, how are you? Uh, Frank, checking in from VA. Um, additionally, so I guess before we before we start off, just a quick format. I'll just go ahead and give a you know short background um, about myself, about Tonus Audio, how that got started, uh, where we are, and a lot of you guys have you know probably checked out the the landing page about the Note One. So I'll just go into a little bit more detail about that product, um, and then we will open it up for questions. So maybe five to ten minutes of a quick you know just background about myself, about the, about the company, where we see ourselves going and, and what we're hoping to accomplish. And then uh, we'll open it up for questions on your end. So all questions will come through the chat um, and I'll read those. And, and, you know, if there's similar questions kind of coming at the same time, I'll try to group them um, and respond uh, as, as promptly as possible. So, all right, so we'll kick off. So I'm Devin Davis, uh, founder and CEO of Tonus Audio. Um, so Tonus is a lifestyle audio brand of headphones and speakers. And our mission is to power possibilities through sound. And a lot of people will ask, well, 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 Devin, what does that mean, power and possibilities through sound? And to simplify it, it's us taking our audio brand concept, our products, right? So that's the sound aspect, music, podcasts, um, any sort of information from a streaming standpoint, you know, from an audio standpoint. And then powering possibilities through sound, the possibilities aspect is the way that we uh, take our platform or our business and basically give others the opportunity to, whether that's education wise or uh, you know, you know, job wise or just giving back to the community. And I'll give some examples of that. So last week, we actually partnered with All Star Code. And I'm not sure if you, if you guys are familiar with All Star Code. Um, All Star Code is a nonprofit organization that teaches, uh, you know, minority boys specifically, uh, Latino, Hispanic, Indian, and um, and Asian young boys, teenagers in high school, how to code. Um, so we partner with them to basically give them an overview uh, about how we go about, you know, leveraging our business, so forth and so on. But that was our way of giving back. So that's when we say powering possibilities through sound. That's one example of what we see as what we see as fit. Um, so that's just a quick overview of the organization. But again, I'm Devin Davis. Uh, I went to Southern Connecticut State University, so I didn't go to a, you know, a top-notch university, uh, didn't go to an HBCU, uh, had a football scholarship there, um, and then from there I actually ended up working at PepsiCo. So I, I know a lot of you guys saw that uh, in, in the bio that uh, Yusuf sent out. So I worked at PepsiCo, worked in sales, um, and from sales, did that for about three years. So territory sales manager, uh, managing different people, but understanding the business from a ground up level, from a PepsiCo ground up level. Um, and then from that, I was able to take that, you know, excelling in the sales role, was able to transfer over into marketing. You know, marketing was really how we got the insights chops uh, to really start Tonus Audio. So it started there. So when I transferred over to marketing, I was working on an interesting team called uh, the Rapid Innovation Team. So with Rapid Innovation, we were literally launching six to 10 new to the world brands every year. And through these new brands, I was, you know, I was serving as a marketing analyst. I'm doing all the research on each specific category, understanding, hey, is this category growing? Who are the key, the key players, the key competitors within that space? Uh, and then also how can we position, you know, if we decide to enter the space from a beverage standpoint, how can we position that? Uh, to be to be uh, successful and how can we overtake that category in X amount of years? 
Um, so after doing that for some time and then giving the strategic recommendation to uh, my, my team's VP, but then also to the CMO of PepsiCo Marketing, I started looking at a few places where I was personally interested and where I had a passion at. Um, so, you know, I, I combined those what I call intersections um, for my own personal passion points. And my passion points were tech, design, music, sports, um, as well as economic empowerment for our community and ways to give back and serve others. So I, I looked at that and tried to figure out a way, hey, what is out there that I can produce or manufacture um, to bring that to market and really make a difference in a way that other people aren't doing. So the idea or the concept for Tonus actually hit when I was, so I'm actually in New York, but I was on the train commuting back, uh, commuting back home from work. And as I'm started to walk down the, the Metro North train, Aisle, I started just looking at everybody wearing a, uh, you know, wearing the general white Apple earbuds, right? The standard ones that come with the iPhone. So as I started seeing that and understanding that the landscape was changing. So this is back in 2016, right around the time where uh, Apple was rumored to re be removing the headphone jack. This hasn't been confirmed at the time, but, you know, these rumors are starting to bubble up. And as I'm walking down this aisle, I'm seeing everyone with these generic white, you know, Apple earphones. And I'm saying to myself, this is a market that's growing. This rumor is supposed to happen. Wireless technology is going to become more, uh, more relevant. And at that moment, it just said, hey, this is this is the opportunity. Um, so at, that was the defining moment where I said, hey, we're going to start Tonus did the research, as I mentioned, from working with uh, the, the rapid innovation team, did the research, confirmed that the market was scheduled to grow. It was a little less than one billion at the time, a one billion dollar market at the time. Over the next five years uh, to 2022 is projected to be two point five billion dollar industry. And that's within the United States uh, alone. So that's not even including global, but two point two point uh, a two point five billion dollar industry. And it just said, hey, look, now's the time. So we started off building Tonus. We launched with the PowerMag Wireless. If you guys have checked out the website, that was actually pretty quick and simple to bring to market. Uh, reached out to a few manufacturers in China, was able to get, uh, you know, and also from an engineering standpoint, we found our engineering partners and we, you know, crafted up a design, figured out how to create the magnetic uh, activation technology from that product. and was able to do a small shipment, just enough to create an MVP to put it out into the market to test. The response from the community, and when I say the community, I mean, you know, not only the African-American community, also just the tech community was extremely positive and, and great feedback. So folks were, you know, we started getting hit up from different places such as, uh, you know, such as Hot 97. And again, a lot of this had to come from basically the lifestyle aspect of the product. So we started getting reached out to from Hot 97, from uh, the Source magazine, a few different tech blogs. And it just really kind of took off from there. Um, and we we sold, you know, again, this company has been bootstrapped from the time of its inception, right? So all money in terms of marketing is coming out of my pocket. Um, so I'm doing whatever I can, but we end up selling $15,000 worth of product the first year. And that launched in January, 2017. So $15,000 worth of product the first year with, you know, no real marketing budget, right? So I think that that's worth noting. And we also understood that the product positioning, being that it's geared towards an active user, we started just going out and targeting, you know, New York sports club or other fitness or active lifestyle type uh, retailers where we can get into the, in front of their audience to verify our product and that it, that it is a market for it. So as you mentioned, that picked up. And the other thing too is in January, 2018, um, I went out to CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. I, I hope, are you any of you guys familiar with the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas? Um, if, if so, just type yes. But went out to the Consumer Electronics Show, understanding where. Uh, so, okay, I see, I see a few um, CES. Yeah. So, Frank, Consumer Electronics Show is basically the largest consumer electronics convention in basically in the world. Um, and it happens in Vegas every January. So, you know, if you're looking to get into hardware or you want to know exactly what's going on from a consumer electronics standpoint, I would advise you to, uh, to definitely check it out. It's definitely worth it. So went out to CES and I was on a hunt to find out how to partner or integrate with 
Google Assistant to get Google Assistant into our product or or uh, Amazon Alexa. So it really just depended upon um, which one I was going to be able to do and, and if they had any restrictions around us integrating that technology into our product from a software standpoint. Uh, so we actually sat down. We had a meeting with Google. That went really well. They gave us basically what I say, the keys to the car. They told us who their manufacturer was. They said, you can integrate it, uh, Google Assistant, into your product. But when it comes to starting hardware and you have these manufacturers, they want to know what type of volume you're going to be producing, right? So again, as a startup bootstrap company, our volumes were relatively low. Again, only selling $15,000 worth of uh, initial product in that first year from the Power Mac Wireless. I couldn't really make the just make the case that Google's uh, you know, manufacturing partners should, should work with us. But Alexa, on the other hand, Amazon Alexa, they were open saying, hey, you know, here's, here's who you need to work with. Or you know, they kind of steered us down the right path in terms of integration, but they didn't have any restrictions in terms of volume hurdles for what we would need to sell to input their product, input the Alexa uh, AI capability within our product. So for us, Granted, Google said no at the time because of volume hurdles, but and Alexa said, you know, yes, and they don't care about the volume hurdles, but both of those were considered to be a win, right? Um, because we've made it, you know, to talk to these two major behemoth companies and be able to access their their technology. Um, so for, from a software standpoint, so that to me was 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 definitely huge. So once we found that, and that in itself was a was a was a monster, and I'm just telling you, like you know, you see the end result, and it looks it looks great now, and you say, well, how did you go about doing this? But I'll tell you, that was extremely hard work trying to knock down those doors to figure out what team should we we should connect with, who's the right person, um, you know, what do we need to do to actually integrate the product? So again, not going to go into too much detail there, but what really what re really was interesting is that when we started this, we had to find the right manufacturer that can uh, really work with us to integrate the technology the way that it should be according to Amazon standards once we decided to move forward with, uh, with Alexa. So that's something that we worked on as well, which was really cool. Um, and now we're gearing up for launch. So, you know, you have the Note 1 coming out. Uh, we're gearing up for launch and we're going to kick off an Indiegogo campaign uh, it was supposed to launch on August 16th. We had to push it back. So we're launching on September 7th now. So we're launching on Indiegogo on September 7th. So Yusuf, I just saw it. Yeah, the Note 1. So let me take a step back. Sorry. The Note 1 is our latest over-ear headphone. Um, as I mentioned, it's featuring uh, it has Alexa Voice, the digital voice assistant integrated with it. Uh, it's premium sound quality. So what makes it different and unique, in addition to having Alexa, it's premium sound quality. So you know, we're competing against the bows and the beats of the world, and we're taking that digital voice assistant, but we're marketing towards multicultural millennials, right? So that's our key target. Whereas bows, you know, their target is not multicultural millennials. Beats is multicultural millennials. However, you know, I don't know if Apple will actually, you know, integrate Siri within uh, the Beats technology. It's two different two different brands there. So we feel like we found a niche in the, in the space to target multicultural millennials, but then also include the digital voice assistant um, that's popular with Alexa and go after our target there. Um, because we know that, you know, based off of our data, 36% of the African-American community specifically are early adopters when it comes to tech, right? So if we understand that and we understand that hip hop, and I'm, I'm kind of going off on a little bit of a tangent, but hip hop is the number one uh, genre of music that is streamed across, uh, you know, within the United States, but actually globally at this point. We're at 30 percent of streaming um, with rock coming in second place. So we understand that we understand where we need to position ourselves as a brand, who we need to go after um, and how we can make a make a huge impact there. So. We also understand that, hey, if our community or our culture will be number one in terms or will be, you know, some of the highest early adapters, because when it comes to African-Americans in tech, I think you guys would agree that 
you know, we're the first ones to grab some tech, you know, grab a piece of new piece of technology and show it off to friends and say, hey, you guys aren't up on this. Or, you know, you're not, an, you're not, you're not you, you know, you don't know what's going on. Right. You need to get up on this. And we're the first ones to kind of tell people about, hey, this brand is making waves or this is the new technology to come out. So we feel like we once we get the right messaging across to our community and our culture, that we will be able to uh, gain good traction within, you know, within the multicultural uh, millennial culture or community. So, um, yeah, so we're launching Indiegogo September 7th. So we're super excited about that. Over the time, we've been basically running Facebook and Instagram ads to get the, the messaging out there, to capture email leads as we get ready to go into this Indiegogo campaign launch, um, the pre-sell the, pre the note one. And excuse me, so that's one aspect, which is the perk sales. Excuse me. So that's the perk sales, right? So you have the perk sales, which will basically, you know, that's early product sales at that point, right? So that's one way that we're raising capital. The second way that we're raising capital is that we're doing an equity raise. And our equity raise is taking place. We partner with a uh, organization called Fundable. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Fundable, but Fundable is very interesting because what they do is they take you through a funding accelerator and they work with you. They help craft the pitch deck or at least shape it up. They will uh, pull a list of target investors um, from Crunchbase. So they'll pull a list of target investors based off of current uh, personas, you know, as long as they fit within your brand uh, and what you're going after. And then from there, They'll launch your, you know, they'll launch your fundraise on their platform and, and announce you on the newsletter. But they help craft all of that, and you actually have to go out and do the pitching yourself. So we we're dual pathing fundraising at this point. So we're dual pathing fundable, but we're also dual pathing uh, the Indiegogo raise at the same time. So you know, in terms of investor outreach that has started, we, we're in some conversations. Nothing has, you know, can't confirm anything just yet. Hopefully, you know, soon. Um, you know, in a couple of days, hopefully a few weeks, I'll be able to hopefully announce something to you guys. But for the time being, we're just really looking forward to executing the Indiegogo uh, launch. But then, all, as I mentioned, you know, going through Fundable as well. Um, so that's a little bit, you know, again, of a backstory. Uh, let you guys know where we are. Obviously, the product, again, is coming out. We have a working prototype. We have the technology integrated. So Alexa is actually working, which is super cool. So you can you know, just speak to it and say, hey, play J. Cole or play Kanye West um, through Amazon Music and it'll automatically play. Um, and then and then additional to that, you can also say, hey, play, you know, whatever book you're reading through Audible and it'll automatically just start reading you the audio book, which I think is amazing. You know, not including to to do list, everything that Amazon Alexa does, but to have that in a set of headphones um, where you're not limited to just your living room is to me is actually absolutely incredible. So I'm super excited about it. Um, I'll open it up to you guys for questions and we can go from there. Takesha, yes, I will send the, uh, I will send the, the fundable link. So good question. Podcast. I think with podcasts, it has to be whatever at this point, it's either going to go through Spotify podcast. So if you have any Spotify podcast saved, that'll work. Or if you have a podcast through Amazon Music, that'll work as well. Um, so you can just speak to it, whatever podcast you have saved. So that'll work as well. Feel free to you know type in your questions. Let me know if there's anything you want me to touch on or expand more. No problem, Takesha. Am I saying your name right? And yes, they are wireless headphones. So completely wireless, Bluetooth. Uh, but the good thing about it is we did include a uh, attachable uh, auxiliary cord. So, and the reason why we thought about that is, you know, with the Power Mac wireless, that's completely, you know, 100% Bluetooth only. Um, the interesting thing about, you know, if we were get on a plane and we're traveling, and your battery dies on the power mic wireless, there's no way to connect it to, to the flight and watch movies or anything like that. So when we thought about the Note 1, one of the insights we have from a travel standpoint, you need to be able to connect it. Or you know, the Samsung 
Galaxy and Notes, those still actually have uh, the headphone jack as well. So we want to be able to include that option. So yes, they still have the, the headphone jack. So this is a good question, Frank. Uh, Frank's question was, what kind of charging induction? And actually, can you guys see each other's questions? I don't want to have to repeat. Um, so if you guys can see each other's comments, then I won't repeat them, but I'm not exactly sure if you guys can see it. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, so, so, so Frank, what kind of charging induction? We were going to go with uh, the USB-C. However, what we realize is that USB-C is not international at that point, you know, universal, sorry. USB-C is not universal from a charging standpoint. So some USB-C is used to send data, some is used to charge, but the uh, the, the rate at which certain USB-C cords charge is not standard across all. So what we didn't want to do was you know, include our USB-C cord and it charges some way, but let's say you have to borrow a cord or something like that. It kind of throws off our, our power standards, you know, from a performance standpoint. So we felt safest going with the micro USB because that's universal across all. So if you say, hey, you're going to get 10 minutes of charge and that'll give you, you know, two hours of playing time, that was the most consistent for us. So that's why we, and plus it's actually, um, it's less expensive to integrate. Got it. So, John, I'm going to answer your question next. So starting from the beginning, you built the MVP uh, and it was a success. Yes. Uh, how much of an investment was that? How did you go about finding the factory in China? So good question. So actually, I'll give you guys a good tip. So I mean, and if you guys are building apps, you already know this. But when it comes to the MVP, we didn't start with the prototype initially. We started with just with the product render. Right. So we took the product render. We laid out the functionality. We talked to our target audience asked them what they thought, you know, from a survey standpoint, focus groups, got all, all of that feedback. So to create the product render probably cost us around, uh, you know, total design was seven, 8,000, right? So, you know, not a huge upfront investment, um, but we knew exactly what we were looking for from a design standpoint. But this is actually after we confirmed that we could get the Alexa technology. So, you know, we didn't want to start going down the wrong path and have to pivot. So we started out, make sure we can get the Alexa, Alexa technology. We got the design right. And then we went after and started speaking to uh, our targets to make sure like, hey, what do you think about the design? Would you change anything? What do you think about the functionality? Would you change anything? What what do you want to see in a, in a headphone? And again, I'm in New York City. So we were asking, you know, New Yorkers, uh, multicultural millennials, New Yorkers. Uh, and it, these are folks that are catching in the subway, catching Ubers, you know, from working out in different gyms, uh, basically they're covering what we feel like is the spectrum of the millennial experience in this in this major city. So they gave us great feedback. Uh, so again, that was probably seven to eight thousand dollars. So not that much of an investment. And then when it comes to how do we find the correct factory in China, as I mentioned before, uh, I went out to uh, consumer the Consumer Electronics Show out in Vegas, and from there. It was literally knocking down everyone's door. So we started off. We had, you know, had some meetings with Google. They put us in contact with their with their manufacturers. Um, I knew some manufacturers just from doing research, but Google's manufacturer once it, once they said, "Hey, you know, your volumes are too low for us," they kind of pointed us in some other directions. Like, "Hey, you know, you may want to talk to these guys or talk to those guys." Once we connected with Alexa, the Alexa team at Amazon. They kind of steer, pointed us in the right direction as well. Um, and then also, you know, just reaching out to people through LinkedIn uh, who've been active in the audio space. Uh, they've kind of pointed us into some dire some direction as well. So we were able to really find out there. And then, it, and then it came down to just receiving estimates and making sure that the manufacturer has the capabilities to integrate the technology that we want to deliver the performance and also the design, you know, from a design standpoint, make sure that we can, uh, that the product will look exactly what, you know, we envision, right? Um, so there was a lot of aspect that went into that there. Uh, so Ishmael, you say, what do they look like? You can go go to uh, note one. So actually I'll, I'll type it in here. Note one dot. So, Ishmael, if you go to note1.tonusaudio.com, uh, you can take a look. You can look at right there. 
So Yusuf, you asked how much to build the first prototype. The first proto, so yeah, this is a this is a really good question. The first prototype cost us forty five hundred, right? And we looked at it two ways. There's two types of manufacturers in China that you're really going to come across, and you guys will pretty much understand this. But there's the low end, right? Most people think you could you think you could get things done really cheap and expensive in China. So there's the low end, and then there's your there's more of your high end mid range. Um, your high end mid range, they want to, they're going to charge you a lot of money, right. To build a prototype because their line times, basically what it costs for them to, to build your prototype on their production line is really expensive because they're saying no to other projects. Right. So if, let's say if they have another brand that wants to run and that brand is going to, you know, basically give them $200,000 to, for a uh, production run, but you come along and say, hey, I want this prototype done. They're going to say, hey, well, you have to give us, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 or something like that for us to get the tools and the molds and different things like that ready. Excuse me. The low cost manufacturer, again, we pay 4,500 for it, but you have to understand that the quality is not going to be what you, what you expect, right? You're going to get a $4,500 prototype. So for us, we went ahead and went with the the, the, the inexpensive manufacturer, paid forty five hundred, and we we did our part, making sure that our sound quality, uh, from a, a high performance speaker standpoint, we made sure that that was solid. We made sure that we had the Alexa functionality. We we you know we did everything that we can we could on our end to make sure that the prototype was going to come across uh, the way that we would expect it to, or at least being able to show. To, you know, be able to take out the public and say, here's our prototype, listen to it, let us know what you think, test it out, would you change anything? What I'll tell you guys this, what we got back in return was nothing that I could have imagined. It did not look anything like the design of the product. Um, it was actually so bad that we couldn't even show it to anyone, you know, and the, the manufacturer, they just kept saying, well, it's a prototype, it's a prototype. You, you know, people will understand it's a prototype, but the prototype, we understood if it was going to have flaws, you know, we just needed to be able to take it out and at least bring some sort of credibility because at the end of the day, you are representing your brand. So if you go around showing people a product that doesn't look good, they're going to question, can you really deliver on this? Right. Um, but the good news from that prototype is that it actually worked from a functionality standpoint. So the sound quality, what we claim actually works, right, uh, based off of our sound profile. The Alexa functionality works to a T. And so those were two two wins. But again, the design was flawed. And that was good because it showed us, hey, the design we know we could fix. If the sound quality was off, that would have been uh, a bigger headache. Um, If the Alexa functionality didn't work correctly, we would have had a lot of trouble with trying to resolve those issues. So we actually took took the design flaw almost as a blessing to say, hey, you know, the other the most important things are taken care of. We can fix the design later on. Um, so yeah, to answer your question there, uh, Tony, do we have patents? Yes, we actually have patents. So we have a, so we have a design patent on the note one. We do not have a, uh, functionality patent because based off the technology, again, Alexa, Amazon, those are op- open source. So we can't patent that technology. So if any other company wants to use that, obviously it's open source, but we could patent our design, which we did. So Eli, other than Facebook and IG, how do you plan on promoting it? Got it. So good questions. Yep. So again, right now we're doing Facebook, Instagram. Uh, what we're going to do once, so you know, once the product actually launches, We've actually been approved for Spotify ads. Uh, so we, we've been approved for that beta test um, from the Spotify brands team. Excuse me. So we're going to be running some, some voice ads on their platform. We'll also be creating some custom content uh, you know, around storytelling, um, figuring out ways to integrate the product and the brand in a way that that speaks to people's emotions, but also the everyday uses that we feel like would, would resonate with folks. So from a storytelling asset aspect, content aspect, those are ways that we plan on promoting that, you know, really beefing up our YouTube channel. Um, uh, and then also through radio. So we have strong relationships with the New York radio stations here. So Hot 97, uh, Power 105.1, 
Last year, we partnered with Power 105.1 on a specific concert. We ran some ads during the Breakfast Club, if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, and then, you know, I think from that aspect, you know, right now we've been really New York focused, really just trying to say, hey, if we lock down a, a region or if we lock down a specific metro area, that's home base for us. So let's lock down home base. And then from there, we can start to go against and start to target our other cultural hubs. So when we consider cultural hubs, it's like, hey, who's really making noise within the culture, the music industry, sports? Those are things that, again, Tonus kind of spreads across and work towards. So, you know, we're going to target L.A. We're going to target, obviously, Atlanta. We're going to look at Chicago and then uh, Miami. So where are our cultural hubs that we'll start to really, you know, create that? And then understanding that those metro areas spread out, we hope that, you know, we'll be able to uh, make a make a dent. Um, from that aspect uh, as we start to, once we get more funding to really beef up our marketing dollars, so. Are you planning on having an app for advanced commands of the headphones such as tuning sound and such? So good question. Um, so when it comes to app commands, the there's actually a custom app that goes along with this in terms of how to link the headphones to Alexa, uh, you know, to control it through your phone. Um, the other interesting thing is, you know, in the future, so not this, not not the Note One, but in the future, we will have other uh, more development in terms of app integration, tuning, custom EQs, different things like that. So that'll be, you know, some other products that we have coming down the line. We already have a product, full product portfolio that we are ready to basically kick off from an R and D standpoint. So we'll have to work on building that out. Are you concerned with the Note 1 being similar to the Samsung Note series, just in terms of brand recognition? You know, that, that question has come up a lot. Not, not overly concerned because the Note, the Samsung Note series is so far advanced. They're at the Note 9 now that the Note 1, you know, we're just starting out. It's a different spelling. They use numbers. We use, you know, the actual spelling of it. And I don't know if we will actually go up in versions, so in series. So let's say, I don't think we'll come out with a, a note too. You know, I, I'm not sure about that just yet, but you know, that question has come up from a brand recognition standpoint. If anything, it it it, it ties you closer to a, a larger brand, but I'm not overly concerned with it. Um, so no. And, you know, we'll wrap it up in let's say like five minutes. So I'll take the last few questions if you guys have anything you know, let me know, but I'm happy everyone was able to join. Hopefully you guys got something out of it. Uh, if you haven't checked out the, the note one landing page yet, please do so. Please join for a chance to win. Please share it with friends. Um, obviously you guys, uh, you guys have been, you know, very supportive, just even logging on to this. So, you know, again, I want to support you guys. Let's continue to support each other as we move throughout this, uh, you know, our, our entrepreneurial journeys. So, What's been the most challenging aspect of the journey? The biggest challenge, the most challenging aspect of the journey has been working overseas uh, with the Chinese, Chinese manufacturers, what they call ODMs. So that's the acronym that we use, original design manufacturer. Um, that's been the hardest challenge because China is 12 hours ahead of us. So, you know, you have to be up, right? So nine times out of 10, they're coming in, you know, eight and nine o'clock. So you're, you know, you have to make sure that you're on online at those particular moments. Sometimes you're working all through the night as you're communicating with that team. The other aspect is, uh, the other aspect is um, when, it, when it comes to work with them, you know, you don't speak the same language. So they, they speak, obviously they speak English, but sometimes it's hard. Things get, get lost in translation. So there's an app that I use called WeChat. WeChat, if you guys are familiar with WeChat, but WeChat allows for, you know, phone calls, text messages, voice notes, um, so that has been very helpful, uh, as well as Skype. Uh, those two platforms have been very helpful in terms of doing business on an international level. So uh, investment opportunities. Yes. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we're, we're launching Fundable. So we have an equity investment opportunity right now. Um, so, you know, that comes at a specific entry price point. And then, you know, if you're interested, we can circle, we, we, we can uh, touch base offline. Um so we are raising equity of rate, you know, doing equity raise right now from a seed funding perspective. Um, outside of that, we're actually thinking about doing a ICO. So if you guys are familiar with, you know, initial coin offerings, this is a little bit further than the line, but it's something that we have our radar on right now. So instead of doing IPO, we'll do initial coin offering 
offer that out to the public in terms of a uh, not a security coin, but um, the other token that they have available where you'll be able to exchange from from a product. So, yeah, that's something that we're considering. So, yeah, again, if you're if you're really interested, you know, we can we can touch base offline. And I'm requesting this is a great story in general, just hearing it from the yeah, idea. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. And I find it difficult to work with a manufacturer in China without being on the ground. How much back and forth shipping wise was there before spec slash prototype met QC standards? So good question. Uh, and I want to make sure I say your name correctly. Uchina, is that right? Uh, let me know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It, it is very difficult. So again, as I mentioned, I'm bootstrapping this, right? So, you know, we were able to raise a friends and family round. Um, we were able to raise a friends and family round, but when it comes to, there's a, a t just tons and back and forth, you know, making sure, hey, you know, sound profile, a lot of things you're, you know, we have our engineers here and we work with tweaking that sound profile the way we want it to. We had to do a lot of research to find the correct speaker that can deliver the performance that we want, right? Without distorting at high volumes that can be able to capture the low ends. And when we say low ends, I'm talking about the bass, right? So, you know, especially if you listen to trap music or anything of that now, some low ends, you just can't hear anything below 20 Hertz. You can't hear it. Right. So, but you can feel it. And I think that's the interesting part. So when it comes to audio, we wanted to make sure that we, we have a, a driver or a speaker that can actually deliver the low ends. So that way you can actually feel that bass. Right. And then on the high end, we want to make sure that that was high enough that can give you the full the full range of uh, audio performance. Um, and then, so definitely a lot of back and forth, but regards to shipping and, and, and QC standards, but, so we wanted to make sure that, hey, sound quality works, the Alexa team, they already have their standards and we were able to work with them to get that done. But from a, a QC standpoint on, let's say durability of the product, um, overall testing, that, that made it quite interesting because we're building out our test now. So it's going to have to be bent, you know, a certain number of times. There's going to have to go through a specific number of drops. Those things we haven't gotten to just yet. We'll get into that as we, uh, as we really just, you know, start the production process. So we're building that, that, that testing QC standard up, up right now. But from a prototype standpoint, we just want to make sure, hey, does the sound quality match our profile? Does the Alexa capability work? And is our design close to what we, what we imagined? So um, that's what we had in mind. So thanks guys, I'm gonna jump off now. Uh, you know, I, again, I appreciate you guys' time. I appreciate you guys logging on. Feel free to shoot me uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, I'll type my email address so you guys can reach out there. And then again, you can also just look up or connect with Yusuf if you need to get in contact with me at all. But yeah, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to to hearing more about these, you know, more about the, uh, you know, the AMAs. I want to see what you guys are working on and just looking forward. But yeah, if you guys are interested, please support, you know, spread the word about the upcoming campaign, September 9th. I'm oh, sorry, September 7th. And we'll go from there. But thanks, guys, and look forward to talking to you soon.